Hi guys, um, this is another one of those static reports. I'm using my uh, Sony uh, Handycam on the tripod in my room. Just uh, no walking and talking with the GoPro. No extraneous sound, so um, love it or hate it. This, you're stuck with my clear image on this one, including my, uh, my pathetic attempt at uh, a gorby uh, birthmark that I uh, acquired when I ran into that uh, glass door. Or should I say, uh, as I told the police, the glass door attacked me. I don't think they're gonna buy that. But anyway, uh, it's fading, uh, but it is still there and it's a little embarrassing, but, uh, and somehow I don't think I'm gonna become the leader of a reconstituted USSR. So uh, it's not gonna help me much in that uh, quest. Not that I'd wanna be there anyway. I've been watching a, um, a very, very good um, uh, YouTube channel called uh, Bald and Bankrupt, and it's a guy named Ben, who's from the UK, but happens to speak very fluent Russian. So he, he's going through the former um, uh, Socialist Republics of uh, Russia, the USSR, and checking out the old architecture. He, he seems to love the old murals for some reason, but he's the sort of guy who will who, who'll meet and shake hands with anyone, <laughs> anyone at all. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite funny watching him uh, go through his, um, his travels. So uh, uh, he also likes to help out old destitute guys in the Chernobyl zone. He even goes there. He's gone into irradiated zones where this uh, old codger is living by himself and uh, he brings him some vodka and what have you. The main thing he provides for him is company and that's what he needs more, most of all. And he's, he's, he's a very personable guy and he has a huge following. Um, he has, a, he has a subscriber numbers, I think 1.4 million, I think is the actual number of subscribers he has. So he's a very, very popular YouTuber and deservedly so. He's, um, he's well-spoken and, uh, and, he, uh, and he's, he puts a bit of humor into what he's doing and um, he's just a likable guy, a likable guy. So just, uh, it, it uh, comes across very well, but I'm not here to talk about bald and bankrupt, he doesn't need the publicity, he's doing well as it is. Um, I'm quite grateful actually that uh, a few people have actually uh, subscribed to my channel in recent times that um, they seem to be liking what I'm doing and uh, maybe I'm getting better at it, I, I don't know, I, I'm certainly, I think I'm more relaxed, I think that's just natural, if you continually make these videos, especially on a daily basis, it becomes pretty easy. And of course, I think I just feel more relaxed being in Vietnam. I feel probably, in a way, more at home here than I do in Australia because I, I just have um, more social inter interaction. Like at home, I'll I'll make my coffee in my own place in my 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 uh, my flat, and I won't be interacting with people. But here, I always go out to get myself uh, breakfast and uh, and a coffee, and I talk to the people that. Um, it served me and they speak a bit of English and I speak bugger all yet but you know it, it's okay it works out so it's it works out well for me I like it here because it for me it's better for social interactions now it may sound counterintuitive in a country where they speak a different language uh, but I am in a tourist area so there are a lot of Vietnamese especially younger ones who speak a surprising amount of English and as I've said in the past the thing that really surprises me about Vietnamese is that they're very articulate in the writing, um, especially the uh, the women. If you write a text to them, they've got a much greater understanding because there's no accent problem there, and and their uh, their vocabulary is not too bad. So, you know, it um, if you can't speak uh, communicate verbally, go for a written message, and you'll probably have more luck. So that's a it's a tip I'd give. Uh, the only, look, the only downside, major downside on this trip for me is, is I didn't expect the air quality to be so bad in winter, and I mentioned that before, and that, that's been a surprise, but um, I've, as I've said before as well, this, this place is great. The, 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 the staff here at Dot's house are really nice. Uh, cleaning girl gave me wave, wave, waved her hand at me three times, I just went up and down the lift, and they're just, they're just really nice people. The girl on reception's lovely too. Uh, the other guests are not so nice. They seem to be. Uh, it's actually quite crowded at the moment, and they. Uh, some of them are actually friendly, but um, yeah, they're, they're, I get I get better um, interaction from the staff, to be quite frank, and and that's fine because they're the ones I uh, interact with the most anyway. So, 
Uh, it's been very, very good here, very happy at this place. Um, I didn't expect to have so many hassles with, um, with Grab. That, that's been a, a, a big surprise because it was really going well for me when I was in District 7, which was about two months ago now, maybe three months ago I was in District 7 and I had to do the commute to District 1 because that's where all the bars are and, and, and a lot of restaurants are and just basically you know a lot of facilities. You can get facilities down in, in um, District 7 but it's more family orientated. If, if you're a single guy like me and you want a little bit more spice with your, your um, extracurricular activities, you're not going to get it in, um, in District 7 but it's a, it's a nice healthy pleasant environment to stay in. I, 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 if I had to be here long term I'd consider it Apparently a lot of expats also go to District 2, which I think is slightly closer, uh, but is still a bit of a commute. It might be 20 minutes as opposed to 25. I'm only guessing because I haven't, I haven't actually checked it out. I should probably just get a, um, uh, a Grab bike and, um, and just check out the area. I don't have a problem getting the Grab bikes at, at, during the day. Uh, it might be at night that they're more in demand and because it's a short fare, they're not, they're not too keen to do it. I got a stack of phone calls and, and uh, when I tried getting Grab Bike and Go Viet, which is the other uh, bike carrier that you can use, uh, but it, I can't speak Vietnamese. If they speak, if they send, uh, if they make a phone call to me, it's going to be useless. I mean, I, I can only really try with text if they can write a bit of English. I just don't have enough yet to be able to communicate with them. So I, I had to ignore the phone calls. I'm presuming there was some mix up there. Maybe. Maybe it hadn't picked out the location I was at. Maybe that's what the problem is, so they couldn't do the pickup. But no one actually hit me with the three thousand uh, dong fine for not not uh, being there, or uh, or for a uh, or charged me for a trip I didn't take. Nothing, nothing like that happened. But uh, I I don't have much faith in using that service to get home. Maybe because I was in a, when I was in District Seven, I was such, it was a bigger fare, a longer trip, and I would, and they were happy to accept it. I think that could be the only explanation that makes sense to me. But anyway, that's that's a relatively minor hassle because I can walk home. I'd rather not, but uh, you know, it's it's it's. I don't feel unsafe going along main roads that have felt well lit, and it's before midnight, and there's still plenty of people around. So it's really not a, a major issue in that regard. Uh, it's just that if you're a bit pissed, you don't want to be sort of. <laughs> you know, it's you're not in prime physical uh, shape to, to to walk home. It would be better. Look, I'm a bit of a tight ass. I should just take a normal cab. That probably might solve the the, the issue. And uh, so I'll probably be up for about forty or fifty thousand dong as opposed to uh, eighteen or twenty. So it's over double the, the fare, but it's not much money. So. Uh, speaking of money, I've also just arranged another uh, funds transfer um, with TransferWise. Uh, a friend of mine, he said that there's there's cheaper options, there are other companies, and, th and no doubt there are, but this one's done okay for me. And um, and I'm not losing that much. I think they're only charging me $12 something, twelve fifty or something for the transfer. So it's not much. I'm transferring a thousand Australian into Dong and um, I'm still going to get over 16,000 dong to the dollar with the transfer, so that's that's good. Hopefully, that's in process or being uh, being done now. I just want to have extra money, so I don't have to worry about money at all. I just I want to be relaxed and have a bit a good time and not penny pinch. It's crazy because you've got to spend the money to get over here. You might as well have a good time while you're here and I can afford to. So why not? So. Uh, my friend Johan, the South African guy, who I'm actually, he, he just basically texts me just before and he's, uh, and we're going to catch up and go to the language exchange tomorrow night at 7. Um, it's, it's, much, it's a bit more sedate than number 5 bar, there won't be as much drinking which is fine by me because I really need to dry out. I had, yesterday I dried out and today I'm going to do it again and, uh, and I won't be uh, drinking tonight, I'll have a quiet night again. I might actually check out the gin house though, because I mean, I, I don't want a, a wild night, but I wouldn't mind at least doing something like that uh, and checking out that venue. And there's also the um, uh, the upmarket uh, nightclub place here too. Now I might go there for one or two drinks and uh, and just see what it's like, because they say that the girls are supposed to be really, really attractive at that place, so why not? Uh, and it is literally only about a five minute walk from here. So I probably should do that tonight anyway, rather than doing the old pattern of going back to the same old bars and, you know, and I've had hassles with the bar girl thing. I, um, 
you know, it's really a shame because uh, uh, Han is actually real, someone I've got on really well. I haven't got on with a bar girl nearly as well as with her. Uh, but unfortunately, she's got this thing with this other bar girl. And it happened to be the bar girl that's been the nicest to me prior to me meeting Han. She was uh, a younger girl and she's been she's been really friendly to me. She says hello to me when when the others ignored me. And so, I, I, you know, I really like her. But for some reason, Han doesn't like her. And I don't know what the reason is. And I don't know if I'll ever find out. But it just seems so petty to me that that, uh, that um, she, she hasn't she hasn't explained it to me. She, she's, and I'm, I'm supposed to be a bad guy for for um, for associating with this other girl who has done absolutely nothing bad to me at all. She's been very nice. You know, what, what are you supposed to do? You know, uh, I think the only solution is that unfortunately Han and I are now going to be history and that really upsets me because I was getting on extremely well with her. So I'm really unhappy about that. I mean, so I think she's been very unreasonable. And it's interesting, I just was watching another YouTuber called Riki, who's a guy who was in the Philippines and has spent a bit of time in Vietnam and fallen in love with it, actually fallen in love with Saigon. Um, and he was saying uh, about expats with, uh, with, with women, say, from Philippines or from uh, Vietnam, that they can be, they can end up uh, uh, henpecking. That's the exact term he used, uh, the, their partners. And I'm thinking that this, that Han uh, sort of started to direct me to sit over a particular part of the bar so she could sort of hang out with me, which is really nice. But she was sort of also taking, you know, starting to control me a bit, you know, and that, that may be the, the thin edge of the wedge. I may be overstating that, but uh, it could well be fitting that pattern that, that uh, Riki has seen with these other expats who have, who have latched on to, uh, uh, to partners in, say, like I say, Philippines, Vietnam, I guess the same would apply with Thailand. Um, they're not all the same, of course, but, but yeah, they're, they're, that may be a common thread. And that may be a common thread throughout females everywhere to some extent. They're more, uh, maybe more possessive, you know, when they, when they want something, they'll, they'll push pretty hard. Um, so it's uh, not just uh, Southeast Asia, it could be just a global thing. And I suspect there is some truth to that. Anyway, I was actually uh, doing this video to uh, not only to, to just do something different from the walk and talks, because I'm pretty well up to date with all my videos now. I've been usually about a week behind, but I've, I've caught up because I've been doing daily videos. But I was, this is the perfect opportunity to look back on the decade, and it's been a, a quite a momentous decade because, uh, you know, 1919 is the end of... Uh, of this last decade and uh, a lot has happened because the, the world, you know, it's a pretty fast paced world we live in because of, of technology like this, the online technology, you can disseminate information so easily and quickly now to so many people um, that, that, you know, that, that, that things change quickly. Knowledge is, is just, you know, the, it, 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 it's, it, it's exponentially increasing because there's just, uh, that the base of knowledge just keeps growing and growing, and then you'll you'll get uh, AI coming into the picture and and and, and uh, increasing knowledge at a pace that the human mind could not possibly comprehend or match it in in uh, in a trillion years. It's just there are things that things are changing quite rapidly. The world in the next decade could be much greater changes taking place uh, than in the previous decade. Although it's been pretty tumultuous now. And then just, uh, I mean, one of the big things I think, and, and, and I think one of the, the good things that's happened in this, this decade is that the, uh, the fake news has been found out, that, uh, that we've discovered that, that the, the profession of journalism has really been bastardised over uh, the, the last decade or so, and that uh, the truth is now not what most journalists seem to be uh, pushing, it's their own agenda at the expense of truth. And because online is now available, now these sources, the YouTubes and uh, BitChutes and other online platforms are available to disseminate information, um, the mainstream media is really, really feeling the heat. Um, and uh, especially in the, in the case of uh, the CNNs of the world, which basically have just given up on, on uh, Credible journalism—it's—it's it's unbelievable. I mean, 
Uh, they are run by uh, Jeff Zucker, who seems to have absolutely no regard for real journalism, and uh, he is driving that that once highly regarded uh, news organisation into the ground. Uh, because what it, what what has CNN got if it doesn't have credibility? It's it's just an empty vessel. One of the only things that's keep propping it up is they uh, they had an exclusive agreement to. Uh, to be aired in airports, but that is actually now finishing as well, and other operators are now moving into the airport area. So that 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 um, that will not be around for them much longer. That revenue stream. So uh, I I just don't see them surviving. I think they're in real real trouble. They're downsizing. They're losing stuff, and it's not just CNN. It's it's, it's um, other. I think MSNBC is is losing ratings as well, and. Um, and uh, I think Fox is doing okay, but that's at the expense of these other shrinking uh, uh, media outlets. So the actual mainstream media in general is dying. I mean, I'm, a, I'm in my mid 60s, so I'm a pretty old guy when it comes to media, but I've, I've made the switch from um, uh, broadcast TV probably 15, 20 years ago. I just don't watch it. I, it, it as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist. Um, I, my news is derived from uh, from radio and digital radio and um, and online. Uh, I listen to uh, for politics. I listen. I get a lot of American stuff. I get some Australian stuff, but I'm only American and a little bit of English. Uh, most of my my news and views comes from. Uh, uh, Sticks and Hammer, his, name, his real name is Tal, and he's, he's, a, he's a rare looking guy. He, he, uh, he, he, uh, he's into the occult and he looks like he, he, a, a bit of a radical uh, devil worshipping type, but he's actually quite conservative in certain ways. So it's an interesting mix and uh, he's, a, he's a guy you would never employ as a talking head on mainstream media. And that's in a way what I like about him. But he's got a good mind. He's got a very sharp mind when it comes to politics. Uh, and the other person I listen to, um, who actually is, mu is more left of centre than me, but he is a libertarian, and I do respect him for that, is Tim Poole. And he gets a very big audience as well. They're both really doing well. They've got um, in excess of a million subscribers, I think, in both cases. So they're, uh, they do, they've got big audiences, but they're not growing on YouTube anymore because the algorithms are now, uh, have now been manipulated by big tech so that now only uh, mainstream media gets, uh, gets to grow on those platforms. Which, what, will, what that will do eventually is it will kill YouTube as a platform. I don't think Google's making money out of YouTube, never has. It's been an indulgence for them. They can afford to indulge themselves because they've got such cash flow elsewhere. But I think uh, the, the, the places like uh, BitChute, who is another option, uh, running a similar thing to, uh, to YouTube. It's not quite as stable as YouTube, I'll give you that. Uh, and uh, I can't seem to get the feedback on comments like I can on YouTube. That's a real failing, in my opinion, with uh, bit you, but they they are on uh, a, a funding drive right now and they're going to employ more staff and they're going to increase the uh, functionality of the platform so fingers crossed things will improve and that is of crucial importance because uh, non-MSM news now is becoming more and more important as time goes on uh, because my generation the baby boomer generation are dying off and, uh, and the younger generation are sourcing much more of their news from these online sources. So, uh, but yeah, Tim, Tim Pool is also, uh, you know, very, very good. He's, he's basically uh, a, a journalist, but he, has, he wants to stick to journalistic, um, uh, to be a, a pure journalist, whereas uh, not an agenda-driven journalist, although he, he admits he has bias. Everybody has bias. If you say you don't have bias, you're full of crap, basically. We all do. Um, but Tim, Tim is actually definitely more left than I am, and I think it's good that I watch someone who has, doesn't have uh, exactly the same views that I do. Um, I'm not a raving free market uh, zealot, by the way. I, uh, I, I'm, everyone has got is complicated to some degree. That's one of uh, Tim's favourite <laughs> phrases. It's complicated. He creates, he's creating his own cliches, it's quite funny, and the people who comment on uh, Tim Pool's sites, they actually, including myself, uh, 
we're, we're, we're quite happy to put shit on him. And, uh, and that's one of the nice things about this sort of um, media is that you, you have interaction with the actual creators. And I think I even have some some uh, influence on him, even though he never he's never con he never uh, replied to me uh, personally. Either has sticks, uh, sticks and hammer. He's never because they, these guys are huge. You know, they've got really big followings. But I do comment regularly on both of their platforms, and uh, and I'll, I don't mind having a dig at either one of them from time to time. You know, if I think they're uh, they're not uh, doing the right thing, I'll say it. And, uh, uh, but it's just nice to be able to air your thoughts, and if you don't hear from them, at least you'll hear from other people who are also watching their platform, and they can comment. So, you know, I, I like the whole idea, this interaction with the new media. You just can't do that with newspapers. Um, uh, they're, they're just the only time I ever read a newspaper is when I'm at back in Cairns at the PJ O'Briens, and they've got freebies. They've got the uh, the Australian, they've got Courier Mail, they've got uh, the Cairns Post, a few other publications there as well and but that is the only time I feel I feel like I'm walking to a museum reading a paper now it's very strange but uh, but anyway these guys are great and now, now of course they're both uh, American although one of um, one of them sticks is actually uh, staying in Holland with his girl or well, he's not his girlfriend he's his wife who he's recently married and he's uh, he's going to be obviously going from uh, the Netherlands to the States and back again uh, from now on by the looks of this. He'd never been overseas before, which is interesting because he's got such a sharp mind when it comes to politics. But he, um, I think he's in his 30s and he never traveled. Whereas Tim Poole has done a lot of travel as a journalist previously. And uh, and that sort of makes him more rounded in that respect. Although I think that the Sticks is actually, a, is, it's got a better take on, uh, on American politics from what I can gather. And it's interesting, I sort of understand American politics because I watch them so much. And of course, I uh, I try to understand Australian politics, but I'm sort of a bit bewildered by what's going on. I'm a bit bit depressed, to be quite frank. I, I wish I was in America, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'd be going along to one of those Trump rallies and supporting Trump because I think he's doing a lot of good for that country. He's, he's not perfect. Uh, no politician is perfect. Um, oh, Tim Pool keeps calling him boorish and. Uh, uh, bombastic, that's another word he loves to use in connection with, uh, with Trump. He, he's, what he sees those, those as personality flaws, I see them as strengths because he is honest. And he, even Tim Poole admits that, that Trump, uh, on one hand, can regard him as the most dishonest president that, that's ever been, and on the other hand, as the most honest. So I, I tend to go on the side of these the most honest, uh, and that's what I love. I mean, even if you don't like what you get, you know that you're not getting spin BS from uh, from Trump. The only time he ever backed down, I think, was on the uh, the, the securities. Um, um, there was something something I can't remember the the, the details, but he had to actually uh, uh, backtrack on uh, on national securities. There was some issue there, and that was the only time. And it was quite disappointing to me because what I like about Trump is he sticks to his guns. And there's so many wishy-washy people uh, who just bend with the wind in politics. They make me sick. I like people who stand up to other people. Uh, having said that, I'd have to say that Scott Morrison has done that to some degree. But it, but um, unfortunately for Scott Morrison, he can be incredibly stubborn as well. And that that he needs to be more flexible, in my opinion. Uh, and there's so many projects in Australia that need to be take that we need to to get going. Whereas I think in America, you know, their economy is going gangbusters because they're they're reducing the cost of energy, they're they're uh, they're which which attracts the manufacturing back to the country. We're just moving way too slowly on that. Uh, we still have too many people that are pushing the green agenda in our country, and it's holding back development. Um, as I say, I think coal is a transitory. Um, Fuel, but it, we it, at the moment it is still our best bet for the for the, maybe the next decade or so. We will phase it out at some stage for sure, but I don't believe in the uh, the, the climate alarmist side. I think they've overplayed their hand. I'm not saying that we are, haven't got a warming Earth. I don't know. I, I I I suspect though that it's nowhere near as great as um, as some some hysterical um, uh, Swedish uh, girl would have us believe. Um, so, you know, I think the world uh, does need to be vigilant on these things, but I think that there's been a lot of vested interest pushing this particular agenda to get government grants 
and I think that the, the science has been bastardised as part of the process. That's how my take on it anyway. But look, pol politics-wise, I was looking back on it and just thinking how much has changed in this decade. At the beginning of the decade, we had the, uh, the Rudd-Gillard government, uh, the, the, the dying years of it, but there, there was a few years of Rudd-Gillard at the beginning. And, um, and then we had Tony Abbott, and I remember when Tony Abbott got the, uh, was stabbed in the back by Turnbull, which seems to be Turnbull's only real talent is to actually undermine other people. Uh, he, um, uh, I was actually at Vinyl Bar, which was my favorite bar here, which has since met its demise. And I remember I had to, uh, I was flying, the next, the, the next day I was flying to Phuket, uh, and, um, and, and it was a very sad day. I remember it very well. And people, I think a few people were listening to the um, to the digital feed um, of, of the goings on uh, on that that particular day at, at the at the pub. Well, I, that was actually at night time. But they, yeah, I was I was getting some information um, through their Wi-Fi on what was happening in Australia. Very sad day. Uh, and then he, then we had the Turnbull era. Oh my God. I mean, he has got a talent. He's got a talent for making people turn off him. He's just not a very appealing person. Um, a green zealot. His his son is heavily into green energy in Singapore, and of course, dad wants to prop up his old his son's business, and uh, and no doubt he's um, he's given him stacks of propaganda in that area in, in the past. And I just uh, I wish I'd never heard the, the, the name Turnbull, to be honest with you. I think I think that's a dark era in Australian politics. And Morrison was a mate of Turnbull, so I'm suspicious of, of Morrison. I mean, he's, he's a damn sight better than, uh, than Turnbull, but that's a very low bar we're talking. I put Turnbull in the same category as Rudd Gillard, uh, um, a, a real low point in Australian politics. And Morrison still has a lot, lot to do. He, and I'm still not impressed with Morrison and his, uh, his ministry either. So, yeah, we've been through a lot of changes, and I don't think Australia is a better place at the end of the decade as opposed to the beginning. I think uh, that uh, Peter Costello and uh, uh, the, the uh, yeah, as, as a treasurer, left Australia in a much better position. Uh, back then than we are in now and we've been stagnating since and it's very sad. We did have the mining boom but we squandered the, the gains from that. People in Norway were much more sensible with their oil boom. They actually invested that money for the future but in Australia we've wasted it in my opinion. And we made some terrible mistakes and uh, and the we not only had the mining boom go bust, but we've had now we've had the housing boom flatten out. It should have been more severe, but the uh, RBA, Reserve Bank of Australia, was totally incompetent by continually dropping interest rates, so that people with savings are getting nothing for their money. It, it just utter they have learnt nothing from the experience in Japan, where they did the same thing and they had a decade of stagnation, and. They've learnt nothing from that. They learnt no, people who learn nothing from history are um, are destined to make the same mistakes, and that's what's happening in Australia now. Our education systems in shambles. They're not teaching history, proper history anymore. So how how is this generation coming up going to learn from from past mistakes? Well, they're not. Uh, not when uh, you have a politically correct agenda. So. Yeah, it's been it's been an up and down uh, decade. In America, has done very well, in my opinion. I think they have done so much better than us. England, the same. They got they finally ditched Theresa May, a total incompetent, uh, and and uh, had no interest in getting out of uh, Europe. And uh, finally, they've got Boris. So they've they've finally it's light at the end of their tunnel. And I'd say that the, that the EU is in for a really bumpy road. I don't think it'll last. I think the EU will disintegrate. Um, that's my prediction. Anyway, that's probably enough. I, I, I'm rambling. I could keep talking forever. I, I want to talk about exciting things next time. I want to keep this going because there is so much to talk about in the last decade. And the next topic I will talk about is technology. And that is a lot more optimistic. We've had so many great things happen in that, that area. Uh, in spite of all the, the doom and gloom in the world, that there are there are good things happening in the world as well. So, I promise the next video will be much more upbeat.
please uh, consider subscribing to my channel if they think there's anything there of, uh, of use to you or entertainment or whatever. And uh, either give do that or give me a thumbs up or, or if you're feeling really energetic, do both. That would be great. Uh, but uh, please don't ignore me. That's the worst thing you can do on YouTube is be ignored.